Chapter 8 Nancy watched as Angie landed the rowboat. She quickly shoved the oars under the seat, then whipped the mooring line around a metal ring sunk into the sand. Before Nancy could start after her, she ran across the beach to a parking area, jumped on her moped, and roared off. What possible reason did Angie have to be on board the Winchester's yacht? Nancy asked herself. Was Scott there? Had she gone to talk to him? Just then, Walt Winchester's dinghy reached the yacht and he climbed on board. About ten minutes later, Nancy saw him emerge on deck, carrying a small overnight bag. When he arrived back at the pier, he handed the dock boy some money and pointed at his dinghy, named Susu. Now Nancy was sure Scott was on board. The congressman was obviously asking the dock boy to return the dinghy to the yacht. If Scott were ashore, he'd leave the Susu at the pier so his son could get out to the yacht. Nancy said a hurried farewell to Ashley and hurried over to the adjoining dock. With all the bustle on the pier, Winchester didn't notice her pass him as he headed for the parking lot. The dock boy tied another dinghy to Susu's stern and started up the motor. Nancy reached him just before he pulled away. Hi, Nancy said. Can I hitch a ride? Sure, where are you headed? He asked. Nancy improvised quickly. I'm supposed to meet Scott Winchester on his yacht. Hop aboard then. That's where I'm going. It was a bumpy, wet ride with the wind blowing the spray from whitecaps into Nancy's face. When they reached the yacht, Nancy scrambled up the ladder. Hello, she called. May I come aboard? Scott Winchester emerged from the cabin, wearing jeans and an old sweatshirt. The bruise on his cheek was beginning to fade. What are you doing here? Scott was clearly surprised to see her. Nancy grinned. Oh, I was in the neighborhood and thought I'd stop by. Scott smiled slightly. Come on into the cabin. Nancy followed him down the companionway steps and looked around the main room. It was paneled in mahogany, with comfortable swivel chairs around a dining table. On the right was a navigator's desk, and beyond it an efficient galley. What a beautiful boat, Nancy said. I'm glad you like her. She was named after my mother, Scott said softly. Nancy heard the note of sadness in his voice, but noticed that he seemed more relaxed than she expected even friendly. Uh, would you like a soda or something? Scott asked. Have a seat. Thanks, I'd love one, Nancy said, sitting in one of the swivel chairs. Scott pulled a can out of the refrigerator, popped the top, and handed it to her. What can I do for you? I've been wanting to talk to you, Nancy said. I saw your father leave as I was headed out here, so I thought this might be a good time. Do you expect him back soon? No, he's flying to Albany before the storm hits. He has a number of meetings scheduled for tomorrow. Scott sounded wary. What did he want to talk to me about? Barb Summers is worried because the police think DJ Divot killed Tom Haynes, Nancy began gently. I promised her I'd ask around to see if anyone knows anything more about the murder. You're a detective, aren't you? Scott said. I heard DJ call you that at the construction site this afternoon. I've had some detective experience, but this is nothing official, Nancy said casually, taking a sip of soda. I'm just trying to help Barb out. Scott sat down at the table, fingering a worn, folded sheet of paper he'd pulled from his pocket. Why do you think I know anything about the murder? Someone saw you leaving the spotted dog with Tom about nine o'clock, on the night he was killed, Nancy held her breath. Would Scott blow up? Oh, that. To her relief, Scott didn't seem upset. I've already explained it to the police. We didn't leave together. We just happened to go out the door at the same time. He asked me how the house was coming along, and I told him about a small problem we were having with the plumbing. But I heard that you two rode off together, Nancy said, wondering if Scott got the bruise on his cheek in a fight with Tom. I followed him as far as the junction, Scott said. He turned toward town, and I headed back here to the yacht. It was a believable story, Nancy thought. Still, she detected a certain tension in Scott, especially when he talked about returning to the yacht. She decided not to press the point right then, 
especially since he had dropped his remote, superior air and was willing to talk to her. Did you know Tom well? Nancy asked. Not really. Scott toyed with the worn piece of paper. It had been folded and unfolded so many times the creases had worn through in spots. He was just one of the construction workers. Once in a while I'd see him at the spotted dog. Still, the murder must have been quite a shock, Nancy said. Yeah, sure, it was. Nancy heard the remoteness creeping back into his voice and decided it was time to change the subject. She took a sip of soda and leaned back in her chair. How did you like your dinner at the bellboy the other night? I thought the scampi was delicious. Were you there? Scott said, surprised. I didn't notice you. We were having dessert when you arrived, Nancy said. The food was great, and so was the service. Angelina Cassetti was our waitress. Angie? Scott sat up straight. I didn't see her. She wasn't supposed... Nancy waited for him to finish, but he'd clamped his mouth shut. Barb said you and Angie dated for a while. Uh, yeah, we did. A slow flush crept up his cheeks, but we don't now. That's too bad, Nancy said. I like her very much. She's lovely. Yes, she's very lovely, Scott said softly. Nancy was amazed. She'd expected anger, indifference, almost anything but Scott's wistful praise. Barb said, you know Angie from college. Yes. He frowned at the folded paper. Did you meet in class? Nancy asked. No, in her father's pizza shop. She works there as a waitress part-time. He paused, then suddenly rushed on. All her brothers and sisters help out in the restaurant, but Angie's so smart. She shouldn't have to work. She should be able to spend all her time on her courses. He abruptly stopped and glanced shyly at Nancy. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. It's fascinating, Nancy said. Are you really a detective? I've solved a few cases, she said, then smiled. But I've never been able to solve the mystery of love. Who has? Scott said thoughtfully. You were telling me about Angie and how hard she works. I'm not blaming her parents, you know, he said in quick protest. They're great people and they treat me like one of their family. And her dad let Angie come to Block Island this summer, even though he really needed her help. Nancy listened, thinking how different Scott was from her first impression of him. Talking about Angie, he was open and warm. He almost sounded as if he were still in love with her. She wondered if she dared to ask him about Angie's visit to the yacht, but she decided not to risk it. One reason Tony's pizza is so popular, he continued, is because her dad's a super guy. Nancy sipped her soda while Scott told her about Angie's brothers and sisters and her mother's incredible lasagna. Finally, she glanced at her watch and said, Wow, I didn't realize it was so late. I'd better be going. Scott stuffed the folded paper in the pocket of his jeans. I'll give you a ride to the shore. He cocked his head, listening for a moment. I'd better lend you a foul weather jacket. Sounds like the wind has picked up. Nancy fastened the yellow slicker over her windbreaker and followed him on deck. Scott was right. The wind was even stronger than earlier. Over its roar, Nancy heard the chimes of a hundred wire halyards slapping against metal masts all over the harbor. The radio said this was going to be quite a storm, Nancy said as they climbed into the Susu. Are you planning to ride it out on board? I told my father I would. Scott pulled at the loose neckline of his jacket as if it were choking him. Was he worried about the storm? Someone has to be here in case of trouble. Wouldn't you rather take a room on shore for the night? Nancy asked. Scott grinned. I'd only lie awake worrying about Emily Sue. He started the motor and headed for the pier. When they reached the dock, Nancy grabbed the ladder to steady the boat. Thanks for the soda. Maybe I'll see you around. Hey, listen, Scott said, you won't say anything about, uh, Angie? Of course not. She took off the slicker he'd given her and handed it to him. I'm a good listener, but I'm not a gossip. Yeah, I might have guessed that. I don't usually... He shrugged, embarrassed. Nancy smiled. 
Thanks again. I really enjoyed seeing your boat. She stepped onto the ladder at the dock. Come back sometime, and I'll give you the grand tour, Scott promised. I like that. She waved goodbye, headed for her moped, and rode toward home. She planned to talk to Scott again soon, now that he had opened up to her. She still needed to ask him how he got that bruise on his cheek, and why did he tense up when she asked him about the murder? Nancy was sure he was hiding something. What was more, the mystery of Scott and Angie's relationship had only deepened. Why had Angie been on his boat, and why did she appear to hate Scott when he spoke of her with such affection? She decided to call Barb to see if she could remember more about their breakup. She had just parked the moped in the garage behind the cottage when Hannah burst out the door. Nancy, I'm so glad you're back, Hannah said. What's the matter? It's Sarah. I just called her, and she was crying too hard to talk. Something's happened. Hannah buttoned up her raincoat. I'm going over to her house right away. I'll come with you. Hannah led the way to Sarah's old farmhouse on Corn Neck Road. Sarah answered their knock after a minute, tears running down her cheeks. She hugged Hannah. I'm so glad you came. I didn't know what to do. What happened? Nancy asked. I, I was looking for a suit, you know, to bury Tom in, if we can ever schedule the funeral. And in the back of his closet, I found this. Sarah picked up a cardboard shoe box. Inside it was money, lots of money, thousands of dollars in cash.